thank you very much. Uh, thanks also to Lars for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So thanks you all for uh, coming today. So uh, I hope you are not too hungry or you have brought something to eat at least. Um, yeah, so maybe a little bit to add to my background, uh, in addition to what uh, uh, Tom said, everything was of course correct. Um, maybe the, the, the interesting path I took somewhere after my PhD was that I started out at a uh, quite large uh, investment company, Union Investment, uh, which are the asset manager of the uh, Raiffeisen Banken in Germany, so around 300 billion AUM. And uh, after that, uh, I decided for myself that that is a little bit uh, far off the way I want to go. So I switched career path and went to a startup company, which is called Scalable Capital, which are located in Munich. Um, Scalable is uh, the largest robo-advisory firm in continental Europe. That's what they call themselves. So around 1.8 billion euro assets under management uh, up to now. Um, well, and yeah, coming from, from that path at some point of time, I thought to myself, well, I've seen all the big firm, I've seen the small firm. Let's do something completely else. So I went into reinsurance. And Munich Re is, as you might know, the largest reinsurance firm in the world. But what most people don't know is that we are actually also a, quite a large investor, not only startup investor, um, private equity investor, but also a firm which has a very, very large um, investment company on its side and which has actually um, also a large interest in producing its own investment strategies. And today's talk is more or less a little bit of my experience about investment strategies, how to manufacture them, what's interesting about them, and also a little bit of my current research, which is more or less linked to like the development of investment strategies. Um, and please, if you have any questions during the talk, just feel free to ask me. So every question is welcome. If something is not clear, I will try to clarify that. Yeah, um, of course, maybe it's best to start with a little bit of a company overview to give you an insight in what's the background actually of Munich Re. So Munich Re is um, a reinsurance company, the largest one, and has several subsidiaries. Um, one of them is Ergo. It's basically the primary, reinsurance, uh, primary insurance arm of um, Munich Re, which basically is the only kind of brand where Munich Re reaches out and also is branding its products. Um, the other one is MEAG on the right. That's um, basically our um, asset manager with around 270 billion euros AUM. It's mostly managing the money of Munich Re because as you might imagine, the reinsurance business is like every insurance business collecting risk premium at some end, like for example, you're paying for, for your car insurance, for your life insurance whatsoever, and is basically accumulating that money and has to pay out in the event of an insurance claim. So there's a lot of cash actually basically lying around which has to be invested somewhere. And that's to some extent the part, uh, part of the job of MEAG. And I'm in a kind of uh, special part, so I'm in the life and health business, so mostly you can think of um, life insurances, um, so that can be anything life insurance invested in some capital markets products usually, or life insurance that is accumulating to some death benefit or whatever. So all insurance, life insurance related uh, products are at our desk. And um, it's kind of very interesting to know maybe because it's usually, um, so when I started at least, I did not know much about life insurance or the life insurance business in general. So normally, what does a reinsurance company do? It insures life insurance contracts and basically takes away the risk of the life insurance company because life insurance companies, as you might imagine, write a lot of life insurance to people. And there are, of course, risks associated with that that might be capital market risk if you put a guarantee on the life insurance contract or that might be kind of, uh, for example, lapse risks if the policyholders stop paying or if the policyholders don't reach the age which they should reach in the model and stuff like that. So there are a lot of different risks associated with that and that's where we come in. We basically structure a complete package of products, so to say. So we are um, basically 
ensuring these additional risks. Um, and for that, we have actually a team of more than 100 um, people now from different backgrounds. So I would be probably somewhere, somewhere between here. Our desk is partly traders, partly capital markets experts. We got some quants, modeling quants who do all the derivatives modeling stuff. And that puts us in a unique position because we are actually an insurance company or reinsurance company which has an active trading desk. So we are trading and hatching our own derivatives which makes it interesting from the kind of products we can provide and also very competitive from the products we can provide. Because um, I think before 2003 or something, there were a lot of other players in the market. You have also AXA in the market, you got um, Swiss Re, for example. And the thing they did, they sold a life insurance linked to market risk somehow, and uh, they didn't hedge their risk. And after the, the so, even before the big financial crisis, but after the dot-com bubble, that kind of uh, went a little bit south way. So uh, it didn't work out for them as they intended. And from that point on, basically the only, I would say, largest or the largest player on the market was uh, Munich Re and some other reinsurance firms, plus a lot of banks. And the banks actually um, were not in favor of the public. I mean, like you know, in the credit crisis, the image of banks somehow dropped a little bit. Um, so they had this thing against them, and that was actually where Munich Re saw the opportunity and stepped up and uh, really um, increased the headcount, increased the uh, global perspective of these products, and kind of built a team which now, since 2005, um, is active in this market. So, yeah, any questions so far? No, all right, so I hope uh, that was kind of clear what we, what we do. So what we do, maybe to put it in a few words, is like kind of like here we manufacture and package, hedge and reinsure a complete package of life insurance products or life insurance linked products, um, where we also take uh, biometric risks plus market risks on our side. And the business is growing, the business is global, we're doing that in Asia, we're doing it in America, South America, Australia, so all global markets more or less, where there's a lot of demand. And yeah, from maybe from a, a, a quantitative background, I won't talk too much about quant stuff, um, what you always think of market risk, it always comes in our context to hedging, basically. So, like I mentioned before, it's very important for the reinsurance firm not to be exposed to market risk. We don't want to take a view in that uh, kind of, that we uh, kind of bet against or for anything. We want to be basically neutral in the market and provide the life insurance product usually with kind of a performance package. And what I've learned over the, over the time, um, there are some factors which are very important. There are factors which are not so important for, for the success and I just, named a few here, so, and I rank them from least important to most important, I would say. Because if we think about market risk and trading and hedging, there's always like the, the star trader basically who makes a lot of profit, that's usually how banks probably sell their investment funds, but that is not really relevant for us. So our strategies, our whole strategy is not based on a single person, which is our star portfolio manager might be based on, of course, computational power to some extent, and also our modeling ability, how do we capture the so-called Greeks in the uh, derivatives hatching, but more or less the most important part from the beginning and the part where you can really set yourself apart in the business is product design. Because a good product design is, in the end, uh, I would say, balanced in some way, so we are only creating bespoke products for our clients, and it's also, um, cost effective. In the old world, for example, one in the, in the life insurance business, one would go take a, for example, an insurance company will go out, wants to sell a life insurance, wants to sell some kind of life insurance that it's linked to an investment product. For example, take DAX index. So you are buying a life insurance product which is linked to the performance of the DAX index. And they're actually buying it from a bank. And of course, a bank wants to make some money the insurance company wants to make some money, then they have to ensure the death benefits of that life insurance contract, so the reinsurance firm wants to make some money. And, well, as you might imagine, 
there's not a lot left over after all these players have entered the life insurance contract and sold it on. So what we find crucial is that we can basically do everything in-house and bring down costs by that. Because there are actually quite some uh, factors which influence the cost of the life insurance product. This can be, of course, the obvious ones, which are market risks. So how does the financial market develop? What can I guarantee? These are fully hedgeable with liquid instruments, for example. Um, there are biometrical risks, that, such as longevity, mortality. They are not really hedgeable, so you can't insure yourself against that, but you can at least measure them. You can account in your models for them. If people are getting older and you have to pay out for a longer uh, horizon, you can at least make, make an expectation on that. You can model the uh, variability of that. So that is at least measurable. But then there are some risks, like behavioral risks, but also basis risks, which are definitely not hedgeable. So for example, basic basis risk is if I now have an investment product which is linked to a very esoteric uh, payout to some, I don't know, uh, hedge fund, PE uh, return, whatever, something which is completely illiquid, which is not actively traded, which is in the end active fund management, for example, then I don't know what that person is doing and I can't hedge it on the market. The same goes for policy holder risk. That is basically the whole behavior of how do people act, not only on the investment side, but also on, on the contract side. So there's a huge, some people are kind of, uh, yeah, redeeming their contracts very early, stop paying in money, they switch their funds often, um, they change the maturity. So everything basically client related, which actually destroys your assumptions in the whole structuring and modeling perspective. And these are some of the risks we are actually confronted with in the structuring part. I'm more on the market risk side and also on the basis risk side. So basically the goal for me is to make an investment product which is on the one hand liquid and hedgeable, but on the other hand also guarantees some performance or brings in some performance on the market and which is attractive to the client. And my colleagues from the structuring team, they are dealing with policyholder and behavioral risk and biometrical risk, I would say. But uh, I thought, well, I have that slide on uh, behavior risk. Let's talk a little bit about investors' behavior because that's more or less also my context where I come from, from my PhD. I did some stuff on investor behavior, sentiment-based analysis uh, and predicting more volatility in uh, financial markets with that. And that's also what I'm currently doing in one paper. So I want to take that paper, give you a very quick introduction what we did there and uh, bring that into the context of an investment strategy actually. Um, that graphic might be known to you. I don't know if you have, has someone seen it before? Something like that, behavioral finance, uh, all the investor biases are, uh, are mentioned here. So if you, if you look over here, if you work for a long time in investment management, then one of the nicest things that you get every morning is confabulation. That is when uh, bankers tell you a story about uh, what moved the market yesterday or might move it today. That is basically they are imagining some uh, story behind their, that explains the rationale. Um, there are also some other nice things uh, over here. Um, let me check. Yeah, confirmation bias every time you basically something, for example, the market moved in the direction which you predicted, even if it was pure coincidence, uh, that is a good argument that confirms your theory about the market. And of course, we tend to overinterpret the times or yeah, the times the market moved in our favor when we predicted it. Um, I, I'm happy to share that also. I think it's available in a little bit better um, quality. I don't know what the IKEA effect is, over there, that is something I have not heard about, but yeah, some of them are at least uh, well known. So this is joint work um, with um, my brother actually, if you're wondering about the name, Sebastian Heiden and a colleague of mine, Moritz Siebert. Um, and what we actually did, or how did we come to that research? So that was not kind of born out of nowhere, I would say. Um, when I was still working um, in investment management as a large, large asset manager, 
um, we stumbled about a public data set of um, investor positioning. So there was a data set out there from retail investors which are trading on a retail trading platform and the data set was actually quite short. And I looked at that platform and found out that I could easily um, scrape the data daily and intraday. Um, so I programmed a little tool that did run all the time and like scraped away the data from the website. So I found out how people are positioned on the website. And the first idea, of course, was to use that data to find uh, a magic investment strategy or whatsoever to make money, of course, in that moment. Um, so I'm still here, didn't work out. But uh, it, at least it was uh, interesting from another point of view um, because, as you might know, there's a whole level of behavioral studies, behavioral finance studies, Kahneman, Tversky, going back to the not even 80s, even 70s. And they mostly have either very short time horizon or they have individual accounts data for brokers, trading firms, and whatsoever, and study the behavior of, of these traders. And what they mostly find in that data, historically, is that individual investors perform uh, very badly. Actually, there's even one study which finds that the best trades in the US stock market are placed in the tax-exempt um, um, accounts of um, traders' children. So, I don't know. You can, you can take that and believe it or who knows. But why do they actually underperform? So there are some effects like we saw on the previous slide um, and the most well known I would say is the disposition effect which is the tendency to sell winners very early and hold losers for too long. And that is something you can actually always see and not, even, not only for retail investors but also for institutional investors. So I've met many active managers who had the tendency to buy a stock, for example, and after it went down more than expected, they hold on to the stock and have the rationale, well, it's, that's a long-term holding now. So instead of calling it loser and selling it, cut your losses, they are holding it like forever. Um, and I wanted to see if we can also see that in this data set. Um, and I also wanted to see if these traders are actually following a certain style of trading, I would say. Because also one thing people are always mentioning in the market is that, well, yeah, retail investors are these kind of contrarian investors. They are taking positions which are, have a contrarian view. So if like the market went down, they are basically betting on the mean reversion of the market going up again. While on the other hand, institutional investors are mostly momentum traders. So I don't, I don't know. So I wanted just to check if that is actually true. Um, and yeah, so I collected that data. I think it's uh, five and a half years of, of, of data um, for 14 currency pairs, actually. And the thing that made it also interesting is that in these retail investor platforms, this is like kind of a, a very lucrative business, of course, um, people are also offered the chance of education. So that is from actually the platform which I mentioned is oanda.com. Um, and the interesting thing here is they also have a kind of a investor education center. They are providing investor guidelines, like telling people don't trade like that, trade like this. And they're actually offering learning. So the content is really good. The interesting question was, do people actually learn from that? So does behavior change over time? So if I well, I know all the old studies from the 80s, I would sus suspect that people actually that are starting to trade now or trading, they would have learned something. So they would have kind of, yeah, not acted completely in, in a behavioral fashion. Um, but they somehow do. So what I plotted here um, is for the um, British pound versus US dollar the average positioning change, that's a red line over time, versus um, the um, return, the, also an average over time. And there are some very, already looking on it, there are some very interesting movements. So this is, of course, uh, like I always say, that's the most famous statistical method called eyeballing, that is here. You um, can already see if, like, 
positioning or price increases or positive return, you've got a positive um, price change, investors are actually decreasing their position. So they are actually um, either taking profits or they are actually betting against the currency. And based on these graphics, I was like, okay, can that really be true? Um, what can we find out uh, from this data? And can it actually also be used somehow in the investing context? And what I will show you is rather the, the what can you find out? And we will leave out the investing context because that did apparently not work out. <laughs> so these are 14 currency pairs, uh, pairs like I told you, around five, five and a half years actually. So I cut the data set in the end because uh, at some point we submitted the paper and I was not keen on updating all the results all the time. Um, and if you go now today on the website, I think the data is even gone. So they basically restricted the access. There is no paid, uh, paid content. So I don't know if they somehow found out about people scraping it from the website or they just uh, wanted to charge money for it. Um, but yeah, I think if you log in, you can still at least see it for the, for the day. The first question actually in the data set was, um, are these investors really contrarian? And what you can do is actually you can look at the cross correlation uh, between the um, change in investors positioning and the change in the underlying return. And what you find is on the day that actually you got a negative return for, or you got a return basically the correlation, the contemporaneous correlation um, here is over all the currency pairs basically is always negative and also very high, so around, around uh, minus uh, 0 0.4, minus 0.2, something like that over all the currency pairs. So what you can see, it's really people have the tendency if prices rise, they are going into a short position on that. So they are betting on mean reversion. And that over the whole sample, you can subsample that, everything doesn't work. Okay. Okay. And then the most important question was, how does that work out for them? And uh, we looked at that actually. Um, and what we did do, we built a strategy that's a red line, the cumulative return from a strategy mimicking the investor's behavior. So every time uh, we look at what is the average position of the investor in the market, we take the position in the underlying make an equally weighted portfolio out of that and look at the performance. And as you can see, that is kind of a very straight line going down. I have to point out that one here is, um, this is a move um, when the uh, Swiss National Bank devalued their currency. So kind of that gap is expected. That is not a gap in the data, but I left it in there because it really doesn't make a difference. You can take it out uh, and you have a slightly better return, but it's still, very bad compared to a strategy where you simply invest your money equally in the currencies and hold them and roll them overnight. So doesn't look so good for them. Um, that is kind of also what we more or less expected. Um, but now the question was, does it really come from the investors being contrarian or is it kind of you can also have other losses. You can have always like bad luck maybe, or maybe they are in one currency, they are maybe positioned differently than the other currency. And it turns out, no, they are basically, over all currencies, they're performing equally bad. So these investors really lose a lot of money. And in the process of research, actually, there was also one story which I found very interesting. I haven't brought it with me today because I didn't find it on Bloomberg, I can remember. It was a, um, another trading company um, in the US which offered stock retail trading. And what they actually did, they thought to them, themselves, well, retail investors are always underperforming. Let's just do the following. We are offering a retail trading platform. And in that retail trading platform, we have a real account and we got a paper account. So real trading versus paper trading. And they had a little fine print in the contract that actually they don't have to move you from paper trading to real trading. They can just keep you on the paper trading account. And since investors are losing money all the time, they will just 
they will just take the other side of the trade, basically on their account in the paper trading, and if you outperform, they give you the money, and otherwise they will just take your money. And there was a big scandal because actually kind of that was seen as, uh, well, kind of cheating in the market, despite being in the contract. But from an economic rational, you can see it's clearly the right approach to do. I mean, if you're already trading against your clients and they're losing money, you're making money on the other side. So they did, they did a rational thing from their side. If it was legal, that's another perspective, right? <laughs> so the other question we wanted to look at is why do they actually underperform? And uh, I knew about that disposition effect and what can you actually do to look at that? You can actually split the performance in positioning, long or short positioning, and you can actually count if someone realizes a gain or a loss on the investment position. So you can see if, if a client enters a position and goes out of the position, if it was a gain or it was a loss. And you can actually count how many times in between he had the opportunity to sell with a gain or a loss. So basically you can see, okay, did he really take, take the win or take the loss? And the interesting thing here is that um, we found signs of this so-called disposition effect. So people are um, very reluctant to actually realize losses. So they realize gains for the long positions in 18.4% of the cases and only in 6.7% of the cases they realize the losses. But on the short side, so they can go long or short, it's even more extreme. Um, there you have basically, uh, the other way, they realize 8.8% of the gains, but 35% of the losses. So that was actually something which was new and has not been observed many times before because mostly in normal retail trading, people can't, can't short uh, assets. Normal trading is usually long only trading, so you're buying the stock, you can sell the stock, but you can't kind of also short the stock. That's the difference with the currency markets where you can actually do that and even apply leverage on these trades. Um, the other thing was how do they actually behave? Um, are they contrarian investors? So do they always bet against the market and that goes wrong? Or do they actually learn at some point? And the thing we did in the paper, um, which I only want to mention here, is we did a quantile regression. So we looked at how does basically the quantile of the return distribution, so if a very extreme positive or negative return, influence the subsequent positioning. And what we found as basically kind of the regression result, as to say, that in the short term you got, this is a regression coefficient, that over the whole quantile, you basically have a negative regression coefficient. So on the short term, with a daily regressor, you got a negative impact, while on the long term, like on a monthly time frame, people are also trying to follow some long-term uh, return or price trends, which also doesn't go very well for them because they are actually realizing uh, the profits uh, not often enough. So that was kind of, I think, the first time someone looked at this with this uh, quantile regression approach. Mm, where you can also see that there's clearly a split somehow between different quantiles as with distribution. If you have a very, for example, very uh, extreme outlier, so in the, I think, 0.9 uh, return quantile, so a positive, large positive return, people are more likely actually to uh, enter a contrarian position. So uh, they really have that tendency to uh, go into the contrarian view, while on the other hand, on the long term, they kind of try to jump on the moving train and get the trend. Yeah, so that is actually a good, um, good point um, to, to jump into something else, because now after I've showed you what uh, are some biases or some problems with investor behavior, I uh, want to play a little game with you. So I hope everyone got a cell phone and you got internet access. Because I now want to, uh, want to test your uh, betting behavior a little bit. So 
This is called the Munich Reed coin tossing game. Um, and it's basically a question, how do you make decisions under uncertainty or if you're challenged with an outcome which has a certain probability distribution. And uh, yeah, it's also the slogan, can you beat the machine? You are actually not play, playing against the machine, you are more or less playing against yourself, I would say. So the rules are kind of uh, simple. So I'm flipping a coin. I'm flipping the coin which has a probability of landing heads 60% of the ta time and probability of landing on tails 40% of the time. You, everyone got an initial bankroll of uh, 30 bucks and we are playing this now for 10 minutes. You can bet as often as you like within that time frame, either on heads or tail with each coin toss. You can bet all your bankroll or you can bet in a little bit less and you can uh, toss it as often as you like. Um, and you have to go to that website, enter a username, and after everyone is done, I will start the game. And if you have any questions, of course, uh, feel free. So I won't participate, but I will, I will get the results, of course, which I can also share with you, by the way, so it's not. Uh... Okay, you can enter any name you like, um, doesn't matter. All right. Everyone entered the name? Okay. So again, 60%, maybe go back, 60% is a probability for heads, 40% is a probability of uh, tails. And I will start the game now. Okay, and you should be able now to uh, Press play the game. Does it work? Okay. The question is what do I win? Like if I get the real, uh, the right side to decide right, what do I win? Are you are, ah, yeah, you are doubling your, uh, um, your money, you bet, basically. Yeah. Oh, everyone else in there? For me, it's just loading. I just loading. So, and all the others are already betting. <laughs> <laughs> it's not doubling, right? I mean, it's just saying the amount back, and you, you enter it, and then you get. Yeah, if you bet one euro, you, you should get back your entry plus the one euro. Um, you should be able to enter 0 0.01. I can only enter uh, four numbers. Okay, okay. that's strange. So maybe you have to use inst comma or dot, I don't know. Usually it should be with the dot. It's not working. No. Ah, okay. Yeah. So did someone already went broke? 
No? Okay. Uh, heads was 60%. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, maybe I should uh, go back to that page, right? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, maybe we don't make the full 10 minutes uh, so we don't get too rich. Uh, so maybe we make one more minute and then we talk about your strategies. Right, so 10 seconds, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and I will now stop the game, okay, the game is over. I sadly can't show you the results because I started it on the phone, but I can, can before we go into the details who uh, won, um, let's see. <laughs> yeah. Did my best strategy. I will. I will. I will read. So let's talk about strategies first. So what was your strategy? Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the expected value of uh, heads was, was higher, right? So I just went for heads all the time. So did someone switch in between because you didn't believe me? I switched when I found out that it was possible. <laughs> okay, that doesn't count. But I mean, there are often are people who don't believe me who will tell me, like, no, 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 you're lying. It can't be the case that heads is coming up 60% and then they switch back. Okay, very good. So you already, you didn't switch. That is already good. Any, anyone else want to share a strategy? So doubling in the winning case, yeah. I switched in between when, I don't know, three times uh, heads after that, I switched to pairs for one time and then go back to it. Okay. So the, the classic roulette player, if four times in a row there's black, you switch to red. Okay, that is another strategy where I can say no, that of course the draws are independent. So since you've got independent draws, it's always bet always on the on the heads is the rational thing, but then it's about uh, position sizing in the end. And uh, I will now see who performed best. Oh, Donald Trump is number one. <laughs> who, was, who was Donald Trump? No one wants to be Donald Trump. Seven hundred fifty dollars was the best performing balance, so it was not not bad. Uh, number two. 
Tate, uh, 419, and then number three is Finance Pro, with 361. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> That's okay. So I I will I can also kind of give you the results later because we also have results on all the individual flips, and that's very interesting because you can see, how, like there are sometimes people who only bet three times and still uh, make it to the top. And you can see how people react to losses. Um, I just have to export it somehow, we can provide it later. That should be possible, yeah, perfect. Um, so, actually there's also an optimal solution to that case. Uh, it's called uh, the Kelly formula. Um, which is something which has made its way into finance mainstream in the last 10 years, I would say. Uh, but it, um, it's actually quite simple if you're confronted with a situation where you know the odds and you want to bet a fraction of your bankroll and the expectation of the game is positive. That's very important. The expectation has to be somehow positive. Um, you should always bet um, two times the winning odds minus one of your bankroll in percent. So in that case, um, it should be 20% of your bankroll that you are betting. And that is actually leading to the path which is maximizing uh, the lock utility of uh, the return. So it's kind of related to Markowitz, um, but uh, the guy who, who invented it or, or came up with it is uh, John Larry Kelly, which was uh, a Texan who worked at Bell Labs in the US. And I mean, most people don't know about him because of, yeah, most people are not, or even, even in finance or economics, people are not confronted with that problem very often. But um, he was actually, I think, made more famous by um, my recent books uh, by Ed Thorpe and also Jim Simmons. Jim Simmons is the hedge fund manager of Renaissance Investment, the best performing hedge fund in the world, who is uh, raking in profits around 60 to 80 percent uh, return. So around, f I, got, I think they have an average return annually about 35 percent after fees since the 80s. And uh, this guy actually worked to the, together with some other researchers at Bell Labs, and Bell Labs was kind of an idea factory. So in the beginning, Bell Labs was a uh, telephone company in, uh, in the US. And when it, so it, that was crucial to kind of get the smartest, smartest minds on board because, because the problems were mostly related to kind of how can I optimize the telephone uh, network, the telephone grid, uh, that was kind of the information age at that time. And um, Kelly was one of the researchers there and also wrote that paper. And you can, as you can see, uh, that is 1965, so it's kind of old, I would say. And even though it's very old, it was, I would say, rediscovered like 10 years ago. People started with don't do Markowitz optimization, do Kelly optimization, because it's different in some aspects. Um, and that is also one, one case of where you have something which is actually not that new, which is kind of coming back to the market. And why is that actually interesting for us? Not because we always know the odds and we can bet the bankroll, because that's usually not what you're doing. You usually don't know the odds of the game, but it shows that actually playing a game which is in your favor, if you know the odds, is still not easy. Because if you look at investors' behavior or betting behavior of people in the game, people will switch, people will reduce the size of their bet after recent losses and all that stuff. Even though if you do a lot of simulations here and have like I put 1,000 participants um, which are using the optimal betting size, they will all have a positive drift in their performance some stronger than others because it's still a game of chance after it's only 100 coin flips. Um, but they are all performing well, but what's actually the problem for the people behind that? Even if you are the best performing guy in there, and beware that is uh, the log bankroll here, so I use the magic uh, logarithm on this scale. If you take away the logarithm and look at the best performing guy, he actually made a couple of billion uh, due to coin flipping, 
it's very flat in the beginning because in the end it goes exponentially. Um, but the guy also loses 46% of his wealth within two coin flips. And that is something where you still have to keep the betting size, always bet 20%, always stick to the rule, don't change the rule, do it because it's still maximizing your uh, long-term profit. But as you might imagine, if you are, have been at 130 billion and then within two coin flips, you are down to 70 billion, it's becoming harder and harder to actually stick with the rule. And that is something people are always finding uh, very, very hard, even if they are fully rule-based investors. And that's what we are actually doing. We are completely rule-based investors at Munich Re, so our funds always stick to a rule. No discretionary element. We are not taking any <coughs> positions in there which shouldn't be in the system because, well, as I told you, it's very hard to beat the odds even if it's stacked in your favor. And with trading, it's even more difficult because you usually don't know the odds. You don't know what your payoff function is. You only know, statistically speaking, that you have a little, little advantage maybe. And um, that is actually one of the cases where you can see that decisions in the trading space should not be driven by emotions. And there are a ton of examples from people, even of that Renaissance uh, fund I mentioned earlier, Jim Simmons, the founder, he was basically a professor in information technology. Um, he also at some points wanted to tweak the system a little bit. He had a fully automatic system. He wanted to put in some trades, do it discretionary, because at some point you always feel emotionally attached to, to your previous performance. And that's something uh, which should be better if you stick to the investment rules. So, any questions to the, uh, towards the game? No. Then I will tell you a little bit about uh, why investing is even harder, because uh, that is something from my experience, my experience from investors, also from people where we sell the products, also from people who have to deal with these products daily, people who are also knowing the game. Um, investing itself, I think I don't have to make the point that we, we, we need to do it. Investing itself, it really hurts. There's a study by Robert Fry, uh, who was actually also working at Renaissance uh, Capital. Um, He's also, I think, a professor in finance, meanwhile. They have a very nice paper. They collected data back to 1927 on the S&P 500. And they looked at the drawdowns of the S&P 500. And as you can see, that is a classical drawdown chart. Basically, you have a drawdown of your capital to some point, And once you reach back to the zero line, you recovered your capital. And you can, on the one hand, see, of course, well, there are some large drawdowns. That is, of course, uh, the financial crisis 1929. So you're losing 85% of your capital if you enter uh, at a bad point. And it takes you even some time to come back, actually, to go back from that so-called underwater curve because your portfolio is underwater all that time. And as you can also see, crises are something that happen. If you look at the time, when that thing was in a drawdown, so 23.1% of the time, the S&P was in a drawdown of 20% or, or worse. So if people start investing in stock markets, they usually think that thing goes up. But what they actually see on a day-to-day -day basis is this, that they are constantly underperforming. They are constantly underwater. So their portfolio is always losing money. And that is a feeling uh, which you might imagine is not nice. If you look at your portfolio daily and it's down again, down again, down again, and then you will at some point just stop investing or change your investment strategy or become dissatisfied with the investing, um, which makes it very difficult from a point of view of sales, but also from a point of view of really keeping in the market, because that's the most important stuff. Be in there, be invested. Um, I even made it e easier than the historical thing. I just simulated uh, normally distributed returns, so something which does not even have fat tails. We know that uh, financial markets usually have fat tails, so more extreme re results are more likely. And even if you simulate normally distributed returns, you can easily calculate um, 
how many days you are in a drawdown larger than a, than a certain percentage. And actually, uh, in more than half of the days, you're in a drawdown larger than 2%. So you're looking at your portfolio and every second down, a day you are down. So I would say the natural state of the portfolio is actually the drawdown and not the, 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 the feeling of having made a gain, despite the fact that you're actually making gains because um, illustrated or took that illustration from uh, a very, um, very nice blog actually from Newfound Research. Um, they have very interesting articles on, on finance and, and research. And they put that together. Basically, how does an investor feel kind of in a landscape when investing in the stock market? And we are starting here 2000 and ending 2018. And I found the perfect citation for that. It's actually from Brian Portnoy. Is diversification means always having to say you are sorry. Because if you take a diversified portfolio here from small caps, US stocks, high yield bonds, and international stocks, and you look at the performance of the S&P 500 versus the performance of the diversified portfolio, it's always like, okay, in the first, first years, you're like, I lost, lost money. S&P performed nearly 38%, you did 5.6, it's not good. In that time, 2003 to 2007, you were, well, also lagging the S&P, so behind the benchmark. Next step, you're feeling uh, that should be, yeah, that's minus actually in the bracket, so that's minus. So you lost money, even though you lost less than the market, you lost money, so investors are not feeling great. And then you're lagging again, you're losing again even more money than the benchmark. And in the end, if you add up the end results of an investment, um, of $100,000, you are actually better off. But still, every time you looked at your portfolio, it felt worse. And that is something which is extremely important. Even for our case, meanwhile, it's, I would say, okay, because I'm now on the side where I'm more in the institutional space and don't have to deal with the retail investors. But before that, I, when I was at Scalable Capital, which is a retail-based investment firm, you have people calling you every day. Every day you, they are asking about their portfolio. Portfolio is down 1%, half a percent, 2%. And that is actually their, their feeling. They are really experiencing pain in that moment. So what can you do against that? Actually, the only thing you can do more or less is build expectation. Yeah. So what do you mean by diversified portfolio? Um, diversified portfolio is more or less a portfolio which is not only invested in one asset class like US stocks. I mean, that's not fully diversified. It's a multi-asset portfolio of equity and bonds, but with an US focus. Okay, because, I mean, if you would just track the S&P 500, right, as a diversified it's portfolio, all, yeah. the, the same return plus the dividends you earn, right? Yeah, that is um, total return okay. usually, always. Um, True. Also, the S&P is also a diversified portfolio in the context of, of uh, stock risk or individual stocks. Um, but diversified portfolio in our context is more or less always a multi-asset portfolio out of stocks, bonds, commodities sometimes, and also with a kind of regional focus. But this is also a um, very US-centric portfolio, I would say. Yeah, as I told you, you can only build expectations, but even then it's, um, it's actually quite, quite difficult because if you're confronted with investing, um, as you might imagine yourself, it's, it, it largely depends on the, on the point of time you are starting. For example, you're young, so you're roughly my age, and the thing we can always say is like if you stay in the stock market for 30 years, that thing on an eight-year basis will always yield a positive performance, statistically speaking. But if you're a little bit older or want to have a different investment goal, your growth-driven investment style, which is I have time, I can wait, I can take risk, will decrease actually to a liability-driven investment style. You will have to fulfill capital needs. You want to retire. You want a payoff function from your invested capital, or you want to save for your children. You want to have something in the end because 
I mean, you might start right before the next financial crisis and then the problem will be that you are actually losing all of your wealth. And then maybe you don't have 30 years to wait. You only have two years or three years or four years. And in that case, your investment style becomes completely different. Also, your psychological background becomes completely different because you always feel the need to take money out of the portfolio. And that is actually a strong case for the stuff we are doing. We are providing guarantees on the portfolios, for example. And from a, so that's now the, the personal opinion, not the product opinion, but from a personal opinion, of course, you can always make the, the um, case against a guarantee because a guarantee costs you money. A guarantee is on the long-term investment, maybe not beneficial because it has increased costs but people are actually not rational in that sense because they actually are driven by their liabilities or by their short time horizon. And that is, for example, a simple explanation why people, especially in Germany maybe, are very driven towards these investments because they have a kind of not a very or completely rational view on the products. Maybe another thing, when it comes to diversification, um, if you look at the tail correlations actually, so how correlated are different asset classes in a portfolio, the interesting thing is also that diversification, even though people tell it, tell to you it works, it, in some cases it does not work. So basically this is always left tail of the distribution of the return distribution and that's the right tail. And these are the um, correlations of the different asset classes on that hand. And you can see that on the right tail, they are not correlated or like correlations are mixed. But when it comes to a crisis and a drawdown, all of them are correlated. So if you are suffering, you are suffering, suffering on all of your assets basically in the portfolio. And that is of course something which also hurts investors and where investors are, I would say, yeah, easily, easily confused because in the beginning it was sold to them as like, okay, diversification reduces your risk, it does, but extreme risks still hurt your portfolio on a whole basis. On the right hand side, that's just uh, something um, a little bit different. So this is basically the same graphic, but now instead of investment classes, asset classes, we are talking about investment styles. So that is something which is called fa factor driven investing. Um, Factor-driven investing itself is basically composed of different strategies and if you kind of sort and mix them right, you can see that some of them are at least uh, negatively correlated to each other and re can reduce risk in your portfolio. So they are kind of the views of the investment world. This is the easy thing. This is the more complicated thing which you can do in your portfolio. And from a statistical point of view, this comes down to the question how uh, you can actually use strategies to provide a better investment return in your portfolio. And what I did here, um, this is actually um, an assortment of different investing strategies. You might know these are some factor portfolios, Pharma French, you might know. So Pharma French, three factor models, uh, uh, small minus big factor, for example. So this is a size factor and there's also high minus low factor. So um, this is basically different strategies and how they provide a sharp ratio in, or in dependence of their skewness. And there are only very few asset classes which actually provide kind of downside protection. So which has have a return profile which basically protects you on your negative tail in the portfolio. This is, for example, here the red star. This is a trend following uh, model, a very simple one. So just want to highlight, it's really, um, really difficult actually in any case to build a portfolio which protects people against the downside and which is affordable. Um, yeah, and the message here is more or less that you, if you're young, you should take risks if you can and Try to avoid them if you can't because in the other case you're in a position where you actually can't fulfill your liability driven portfolio needs.
That is something which can be done like, or what should be done with different strategies or what we are doing with different strategies. This can be kind of, um, like I mentioned, the trend following strategy where you, this is actually that graphic over there, where you shift your return distribution um, to the right, so you have actually positive skewness. And this can be achieved with other overlays, with different alternative strategies, with a direct tail risk hedging strategy. So it's kind of always the right mix for the client. And also in, um, in research, this has now more or less entered the, I would say, the game of research that there are, ex there are existing different strategies that might be useful in different market environments and which are sometimes also not effective in other market environments. And that is actually something we are looking at. So we are kind of taking building blocks of different strategies, trying to combine them in a risk overlay way. So kind of controlling the investor's risk where the main goal is to achieve a portfolio return distribution which suits the behavioral needs of the investor, which can be different depending on the age, depending on the income, depending on the outflows of money. And that is something where you, where at least I was a kind of, um, when I started in the business, I, I didn't know that. So I didn't know that it existed. I didn't, I didn't know that it was sold because what you usually get on the market is kind of a very standard solution, I would say. Yeah, any questions so far? So that is just, kind of my experience from, from some of these strategies, from some of the ways you can put together um, different parts of strategies to form your desired investment outcome. Um, maybe just a few words about what in our mind is actually the guiding principle of the success because that is actually what we are doing. We are doing 100% rules-based strategies so there is no discretionary element in that. Um, we are providing these strategies through independent calculation agents. So these are usually indices which are calculated by uh, different sources, like the S&P stock market index, for example. We try to be diversified, so we combine either different strategy parts, so be it trend following, be it carry value momentum in one portfolio, or we take as many markets as we can, let's be equities, commodities, bonds, markets, everything. Provide that at a cost efficient basis, more or less because we manufacture it all ourselves. And also make sure that we are actually aligned with our investors. So I would say always, if someone wants to sell you something, always ask, are you invested yourself and show it to me. Because that's the most important investment if someone wants to, is not using his own product actually, then it's mostly because it's not worth it, I would say. Or he had, might have different exposure, but for example, for our case, uh, Munich Re itself, our pension system is investing in one of our uh, strategies. Uh, our internal uh, asset liability management is investing in our strategies. Um, so our interests as a product provider are also aligned with the interests of the investor itself. And, and maybe the most important part is patient and uh, discipline. Um, should always focus on your long-term goals and don't get too confused by short-term investments and results, emotions, and like in the coin flipping game, short-term losses or unclear strategy, uh, advisors, whatever. So that is basically the point. Okay, if you want, I can also talk a little bit about uh, diversified trend following. I have some slides on that, but uh, we can also just uh, enter the discussion so whatever you feel is best. I think it's good if we go for the discussion. It's up to you guys. Yeah. So that I don't give you a too specialized view because like, no, like the investment strategies, of course, that's something I'm doing in a day-to-day -day business. But um, I'm also interested in your views and what are you doing? Uh, how might there be some overlap? Uh, What's your focus? Or I can tell you something about other experiences I got. I mean, for example, the patience and discipline thing, um, I think it's very important because, for example, if uh, we look at 
where I come from the robo-advisory business where you always got your app on, on hold and can you check your portfolio every day. Um, I think that is not beneficial, for example, for an investor. That's my hypothesis, I would say. I'm very positive on like people having the full insight also on costs and everything. But I would say, for example, that is something where technology is actually um, in contrast to the investing needs of the customers. So can you say a bit more about what you think about technology in the sense that uh, you know, some people say that AI is the reinvention of statistics with very inefficient methods and <laughs> uh, you shouldn't actually use it, right? Uh, and so my question would be, I mean, it could be that there are some underlying patterns in uh, statistics or financial markets, right? We don't know what it is. So are you experimenting with that in terms of that you're trying to use uh, AI methods to predict returns? Yeah, I mean, one thing we are definitely doing is, um, is uh, um, looking at different patterns uh, in all sorts of ways. Um, so we are more or less in the space where we are harvesting different risk premia, for example, um, the different methods. I mean, the oldest thing is more or less trend following, for example, which is one of the anomalies of finance where you can basically, by following trends, create an outperformance against the underlyings. Um, do we look at machine learning? Um, I mean, you can call many things machine learning. Um, that is the problem I'm having with the whole machine learning concept. The other problem I have is more or less where I come from. I've have heard machine learning 10 years ago. There was neural networks. Then it was like, uh, I don't know, deep learning and deep portfolio optimization and deep whatever. And the only thing I saw so far that it's more or less, I think, uh, has, or has exited the phase of being overhyped at the moment, at least. So it's, when I speak to institutional investors, it's more in a, in a phase now where it's actually, they look at that with a critical view and they um, use it maybe for data filtering, I would say, or also kind of detecting some patterns. Um, but I'm not 100% convinced that that's the way to go. Um, because, so, I mean, if you look at very liquid markets, which are traded by basically everyone, where you can actually enter exit positions at every time, then I think these markets are more or less efficient in the sense that you will not gain an advantage with uh, some alternative data or whatever. Um, if you look at niche markets, that's a completely different story. But there you mostly don't even need kind of fancy machine learning tools, which tend to overfit or, or things like that. You more or less need the insight why things are happening. For example, to give you a very, very simple example, there's something kind of um, in the dividend futures markets, for example, they have read some papers about mispricing and pricing anomalies, why are dividend futures cheaper than they should be, for example. And there's a very easy explanation for that. The explanation is that investment banks have to get rid of the dividends they have there in, in their derivatives and have to basically sell divid dividend futures on the euro stocks, for example. That thing is 20 years old already. And from, from that point of view, I would always say there are anomalies but they're more or less f found not by machines, but by people. But maybe I also haven't found the, the magic machine learning algorithm, so I don't know. Yeah. But also the people I, who are more or less in the space of the machine learning, um, I haven't seen anyone doing anything fancy that brings you some advantage, actually. So in most cases, it, it comes down to, to having a very robust and very efficient systematic process behind the strategy and leveraging some edge you have from a different background, I would say. And the view that you can go out there and get the smartest algorithm and develop the world model, um, I'm kind of skeptical. But, and, and, and also, I would say people have now taken a different route. Most people are now selling machine learning. So it's like with the gold digging in, uh, in America, when that was prominent, the Germans became not rich because they found so much gold because 
be, but because they uh, actually sold the equipment, yeah, the shovels. So you should probably found a machine learning company and advise people. I think that's a better way. Yeah, sell the hardware. <laughs> but I'm, I'm also easily convinced if someone comes with something, um, it's kind of definitely an interesting field. And who knows? That's the whole point of research. Mostly you don't know, and in the end, you find something, and then maybe it works, maybe not. So who, who here is doing behavioral economics or something in that direction? So you, so you are, but you're not uh, participating in the game or you couldn't. So I can send you the, the outcomes. <laughs> so uh, yeah, question regarding behavioral economics. So um, do you see any kind of what you say about progressing behavior when you're young and when you're old to have a different view on, 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 on the expectations because you're getting older, you have an other time frame um, than contemporary when you're younger. So do you think that this kind of hyperbolic economy behind that or is it something else? Or I mean, it's a good question, right? Uh, so I haven't uh, actually I haven't looked in the data myself, so I don't have a database discriminating between ages and kind of looking uh, into if the really reality is in line with expectations there. But uh, that goes rather from literature I'm le reading or from my feeling, the feeling that I have actually when I talk to people, what's their view on, on the, their portfolio actually. And that might of course be a function of age or time until maturity or whatever, but can of course also be uh, from a different perspective, from an increase in, I don't know, like risk awareness maybe with uh, also learning effects. So I would say I can't give you the numbers on that. I mean, I'm sure we have data on that. I'm, I'm sure we have because um, there are of course always in these insurance contracts um, calculations regarding to that fact but I'm not the guy who is sitting at that data and I must admit I haven't looked in that, into that. So, but if you want, it's definitely a way to find that out. Because there are also the, all these assumptions with how many people are lapsing and what's kind of pre, there's a prepayment risk, for example, all that is usually estimated in a statistical way. So we have data on that somewhere and we have models for that. Um, but that's uh, r less on the market side and more on the, um, yeah, on the structuring side or on the actuary side. But there is definitely uh, data on that. So only I've seen, I, I can rem remember one, yeah, there are some, some slides or some graphics I can remember where there's at least the correlation between, for example, education and lapse rate. So usually more educated people tend to also pay their insurance contract until the end. Because usually in that insurance contract, you're paying a lot of money in the beginning. And so it does not really make sense that you stop paying if you already paid all the, all the costs and you should just carry that until the end, actually. And there's some kind of discrimination, for example, um, related to education, at least. And I, there must also be a difference between age. Might even have the slide I can show you later. But I'm not sure what's on there. There may be, I don't know, uh, talking against uh, my own hypothesis. Who knows? <laughs> Yeah. You're not just tracking the same stuff uh, all the time. You don't do the cost of learning, just uh, wait for seven years and wake up. And then after you invest in 2001, you realize uh, seven years later all the money is gone. Um, so, but the next 
next problem that arises, right? I mean, you have to find out which robo advisors actually the one you would like to give your money in, right? Mm. Because uh, it could be that some of them are just frauds, they are very young players, uh, so it could also be that they have a bad investment strategy. Um, and then you have a new problem as an investor, right? I mean, you know that probably the robo advisor and the technology does a good job for me, but I don't know which one. So is the solution that I have to diversify across robo advisors? <laughs> what, is, what is the solution? Then? Yeah. Um Maybe uh, to that point, I also got one slide at least, so that is some behavioral finance stuff. Uh, we also got a robot advisor, so by the way, so good question, yeah. Um, that is not a retail market, that is more white labeling, but you can also register, and that is actually not only a robot advisor, but something where there's a guarantee provided um, on the robot advisor because we wanted to kind of make also the case that this can be a distribution <coughs> platform and this is an eff efficient distribution platform. Um, but of course, we are not highlighting that um, like other robot advisors do. So this, I think, Get Garden or Garden Invest um, was started three or four years ago, actually, and is a white label product and um, is also available for retail investors. But um, like you said, there is now a market like 30 robot advisors out there. And like in the, in the I would say, if people look at them, it's more or less seems to be the same, of course. You can go to, of course, ranking uh, web pages like Broker Vergleich, for example. They do at least a performance uh, or a performance view of the robo advisors. But otherwise, as an investor, I would say it's very, very difficult to find out what they are really doing. Um, I mean, the tendency we see is that people are just choosing the cheapest one. Um, but usually these are then the ones who are just offering a fixed weight portfolio like 60% stocks, 40% uh, bonds and then of course most investors will say okay I can do that myself where they are probably right. So the market is definitely interesting but it has to fight the same problems as every other asset management investment that investing is first of all not sexy, it's not a cool business, that thing does not sell itself. Um, so even if robot advisors are advertising with like the hundreds of people demanding that, actually it's still hard sales. So and they, especially the bigger ones, scalable, they are now in the position where they have to kind of find out that really acquiring new people is also kind of hard. And um, all the others are too. So I would, in, in, this, in that market, I would also expect that there will be a shrinkage of uh, the robot advisors. Um, the interesting fact is actually that most of the robot advisors coming out of the big asset managers have never made it or not really made it. And there's also an interesting point because we also got a robot advisor at um, Union Investment and the concept, everything is good, but at the big companies you of course have the problem that it's very, a very political topic actually. I mean you are cutting out sales and you have to tell your sales guys that instead of 3% that's not the job of the web page and that's costing nothing or maybe 1% and uh, there you make yourself a lot of enemies of course because it's still uh, a sales and money business. Yeah. And maybe also going forward it's um, at least my view that the, in the robot advisory business it's easy as long as your target audience is very clear but it becomes uh, very difficult if you go into the broad market because if you have to deal with like people who have never heard of investing, who don't know the instruments, you ha are facing the same problems as every retail sales guy that you have to talk to people on a daily basis. They are looking at the app, portfolio is down, they are calling you, you have to answer them and it's just more or less like in the professional investment business probably at every step you're managing people's expectations and that's the main part you're managing expectations and emotions um, because no one not even the guys investing are probably fully 100 percent rational so i'm 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 really curious how that uh, will go forward um, with the robot advisors um, of course since i worked at scalable i of course have to say they're the best <laughs> No, but uh, it's actually there's going a, a lot on behind the scenes, so it's more, um, I think if you're in the business, there's a clear view on who is doing very simple stuff 
and who is doing more complicated stuff and who is also doing things more efficiently and I would definitely say that Scalable for example or the big players Scalable, scalable Query On maybe uh, they are doing a very transparent job I would say and there are some players where I'm sure they won't exist in the next five years at least. Yeah. I mean one, one very simple example to give you one example was one robot advisor actually who did, had a constant portfolio so no rebalancing from the beginning and had top performance over three years and then they did their first rebalancing and a rebalancing, rebalancing in ETFs is a taxable event. If you're selling one ETF to buy another one in a client's portfolio you're creating taxes or you have to realize tax, taxable gains and the problem then was that their performance dropped basically from plus let's say 10% to minus 7% because they had to realize all the taxes from three years ago and that is for example something where I would say that is a very unfortunate design by by this strategy and there I would say going forward there will be cases where we'll, we'll hear more about that and then it will also be more clear who is the dominant player in the market. Yeah like also how are they called uh, ah, one got bought by Money Farm uh, that was the one who had a little little squirrel in, in, in the logo I have even even for, not nutmeg, something else. I forgot. They got. They went past. They b were bought. There were others. Uh, probably in ten years, it's like with every investment fund. In ten years, no one knows the name anymore. No one knows who uh, was the survivor of the game, and who went bust. So at least some people, some guys also did uh, thematic investing. Um, how were they called? I don't remember. So. I mean the, the, the amount of money you have to have under management is actually not that large but you also need a lot of resources. Um, they are like normal, normally family offices and funds they are managing a few billion euros with five to ten people and uh, robo-advisors if you look at the stuffing there are maybe 20 to 100 people in a robo-advisory firm and you have to calculate okay does it make sense uh, how much money do they have to bring in actually so it's always about the growth and growth but um, I don't know if, if that's really sustainable at some point so the biggest ones yeah the smaller ones definitely not but that's like with every startup they are probably gambling to be bought Yeah, definitely. So I'm also very interested, uh, interested in what's going on actually in your research and uh, maybe you can tell me something about that and also I'm always flexible in my opinions. Like, <laughs> like you, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a book, <laughs> Super Forecasters, and the main, main uh, point I got from that book actually is that the good forecasters are very flexible in their opinion. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.